Well, hello, people of God. It's good to be with you and to open God's word once again together. We want to look together once again at Exodus chapter 20, and we'll begin our reading at verse 1 to remind ourselves of the important prologue to the Ten Commandments, and then we'll read through verse 21. So let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near. To the thick darkness where God was. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Um, We see once again why that perspective we talked about last time on the God who gives the law is so important to understand why, how God wants his people to receive this law and the purpose for which he gives it, because he wants his people to walk with him. And we're beginning with God as the redeemer God, who has out of his covenant love and promises redeemed a people for himself and therefore wants them to walk before him helps to give that crucial perspective on his law that we need to rightly understand it. This is a law for people with whom God has made a covenant for a people whom he has redeemed from slavery. It's sort of like what Jesus says in John 15, nine through 11, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Um, Just as the Ten Commandments begin with a statement of who God has been for us, uh, so Jesus says in John 15 that that God's love is the starting point. Um, God loves us, therefore we are to respond with love. And God wants us to do this because that's the only way for our joy to be complete, to walk with our God. I think one of the most fundamental misunderstandings of the law is when people begin to think, well, you know, this is God's way of restricting what I can do, rather than seeing it as God's way of saying, I want your joy to be full, and your joy will be full to the extent that you walk with me in love the way I've commanded you. It's actually for your good, for your joy, that these laws are set out. Um, And that's really what God is doing in these Ten Commandments, telling God's people how to walk with him and find joy in fellowship with him. Um, We're not going to go through each one of these Ten Commandments. That would take a long time. That's the subject of weeks of instruction as we go through the catechism. Um, But seeing this law as a law for a redeemed people definitely changes the perspective. These commands don't come to us and say, earn my love. Right? God doesn't say through these things, earn my love, but he says, as the, as the Lord Jesus says in John 15, this is how those who've been received into God's favor are to walk. 
Um, so it's not earn my love by your faithfulness. It's abide in my love. Uh, walk according to this standard as a law of gratitude in view of the grace that's been showered upon you because this law is meant to preserve freedom and preserve liberty. That's what, again, that your joy would be full. I don't want you to fall back into slavery, into the slavery of sin, into the dominion and the dominion of the devil in that way. Uh, those are all things that are of the ways of the past, the past that was slavery. God doesn't want us walking in those ways. He wants us to enjoy freedom. He wants us to enjoy liberty. We, we hear an echo here in the Ten Commandments of, of the situation for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's how the law functioned for them. They were free, right? They, were, they had perfect liberty in the, in the Garden of Eden. They were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the law God had given them. But apart from that, if they maintained that law, they would, they would preserve their freedom. They would maintain their joy, right? They were free to eat of any tree in the garden except for that one tree. Uh, they had perfect freedom in the garden to do according to all that God had commanded them to do. <coughs> and as long as they kept his law, they kept their freedom, right? As long as they preserved the law, they preserved their freedom. But the minute they transgressed it, they would enter into slavery for sin. And there's an echo of that here in the Ten Commandments. Israel's being reminded walking in the law is the way to actually preserve liberty, is actually the way to preserve freedom. It's actually the way to find joy as God's people to walk according to his law. Um, maybe some you know, concrete points from, from the Ten Commandments can help us understand how God is arguing this way with his people. Uh, look how often the phrase, the Lord your God, appears in the Ten Commandments, right? It appears in verse 5, um, uh, the Lord your God. It appears in verse 7. It appears in verse 10. It appears in verse 12. Um, it's the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt. That's, that's what's being reminded of every single time that comes up. It's the Lord your God who rescued you. So why would you willingly serve another God who is no God? Right? The Lord your God is the name of the God who rescued you from slavery. Why would you treat his great name as an empty or worthless thing? Taking that name in vain. The Lord your God rescued you from Egypt. And he's given you a, one day a week that you might rest from your work as he did in creation. Why would you not enjoy the rest that he has given you? When we see it in that perspective, it shows us that really disobedience to his law is ungrateful. Um, it's ingratitude to the God who has saved us, it's, and it's unwise because this is the God who's given us the law so we might walk with him and preserve the redemption and liberty that he's provided and avoid the kind of, the kind of wickedness that is absolutely repugnant to him. Um, and so not only is it an act of ingratitude to the God who's redeemed us and who's out for our joy, but worse, it puts us at odds with a God who also reveals himself to be both a just God and a jealous God. Right? The Lord your God is a jealous God. He's a faithful spouse. And he will not let our spiritual adultery go unanswered. Um, the, the Lord's jealousy is really the only kind of jealousy that is, that is good. Our jealousies are always sinful and selfish. Uh, but God's jealousy is actually a love for the sake of the bond he has with his people. Um, he's zealous for us, maybe is another way to kind of think about it, um, out of his love. So when we sin, it puts us at odds with this God who is jealous for our relationship and will not allow spiritual adultery to just stand in our lives. He's also a just God. He will not leave iniquity unpunished. Um, and so that reminds us of what sin is. It's for the Christian, it's an ingratitude that puts us at odds with a just and jealous God. Um, that's why it's such a serious thing to transgress the law of God, even as Christians. Because God gives us his law so that we would continue to walk with him in fellowship and in freedom and experience the joy of doing the things that are pleasing in his sight. And so we're reminded here God wants his people to walk with him. That's an important part of what God calls us to. But he also wants us to have a proper fear of him. We see at the end of this chapter that, that kind of fear that God does not want and the kind of fear that God does want. Um, there's a kind of fear that people show that Moses said, you should not do that. 
It's kind of an interesting thing that Moses says, right, in verse 20. Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him might be before you. Don't fear God. He wants you to fear him, is almost what Moses says. What does he mean by that? Well, he's showing there's an improper fear. Right? When the Lord speaks, when he speaks this law of freedom as a redeemer God to his people, that their joy might be complete, that they might walk with him, how do they respond to that? They can't get past the holiness of God that they see displayed on the mountain. They want to stand far off and they say to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Um, it's this fear that the voice of the Lord means death for them. But has God drawn near to his people in order to destroy them? He is unapproachable in his holiness. There's a sense in which anything that touches a mountain will still have to die. But God is flashing in fire here, like that fiery torch, not to consume them. Not That fiery torch that came to Abram was not to consume him. It was to covenant for him on his behalf. And here too, that all of this holiness, all of this display of, of the unapproachable holiness of God, God's voice speaks out of that scene, not to kill, but to give guidance to how his people continue to live, can continue to live in joy before his face. And that's why Moses exhorts God's people to a proper fear of him. What is a proper fear of God? It's not a terror that he has come to kill us. <clears throat> what is a proper fear of God? It's reverence and gratitude. An improper fear always assumes that God is, God's purpose is our destruction. But what does a proper fear do? A proper fear comes and realizes that God's purposes for us are salvation and blessing. He had already told them that back in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for the, all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God wants us to revere his holiness and be grateful for his salvation, and so that a proper fear of God is in us, a proper fear of God, which is what we call true faith. It's that proper fear that will be a true motivation for walking according to God's commandments, right? And Moses connects that, a proper fear and walking with God. Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him might be, may be before you, that you may not sin. Right? He wants you to have that proper fear that will cause you to walk in his ways and help you not to walk against him, a faith that will be fruitful for you. God called them, had called them to obey in chapter 19. They promised to do it. And the Lord's law comes as a test of that resolve. Is your commitment genuine? And without a proper fear of God, a true faith motivating holiness of life, they will not keep his law. It's a reminder that their own commitment and resolve is not enough. That only the fear of the Lord can actually produce obedience in the lives of his people. Only true faith can produce fruit in our lives. Um, only a true faith in God, worked in us by the Holy Spirit, has the power to actually be fruitful, to turn away from the sin that his law condemns and towards the obedience that his law commends so that we do not sin. And this is the good news that God comes to his people with through his mediator Moses, that God's purpose is not to crush his people with the law. That's not his purpose, but to confirm his covenant of grace with them by which he will make them live. And the good news is brought to them by Moses, who is the mediator of the covenant. When God's people are afraid, it's the mediator of the covenant who says, do not be afraid. And when they stand far off, he's the one who goes up to God on their behalf. And this is a picture again of that even greater mediator who would come who is not just a faithful servant like Moses in the house of God, but who is the son, the mediator of a new and better covenant, the covenant of grace, Jesus Christ, right? So that when God's vision of holiness is working that improper fear in our hearts that God has come to destroy us, uh, that we won't be able to stand before him and live, Jesus comes to us and says, on behalf of my work, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. 
And he causes our hearts by his spirit to be filled with reverence and gratitude for the salvation that he has provided by his blood. And he gives us his spirit who writes these commandments on our hearts so that we begin to walk according to all that the law commands. And wherever we fall short, he blots out our sin by his sinless perfection offered once for all on the cross and continues to intercede on our behalf before our God. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is to know that when I'm tempted to stand off from God for fear of what he will bring to me, it's Jesus who goes near on my behalf uh, to intercede before the Father. And that's how Jesus continues to bring the law of God to us today, reminding us that we are called to walk with him in love, in obedience to all of God's commands. And then by his spirit working that fear of God, that true faith in our hearts that produces reverence and gratitude to God for our salvation that causes us to begin to walk not only according to some but according to all of God's commands and Jesus does this in us by his spirit so that his redeemed people might have life and have it abundantly thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift let's pray and thank him for it father in heaven we thank you for this word we thank you for this reminder that you have given your law to us not that we might be crushed by it but that we might preserve the liberty and freedom that we've been given by you, our gracious Redeemer. And so help us to come to the law that way, to see it as a guide for gratitude, how to show our love for you, how to avoid the things that you hate uh, as a jealous and just God. And that because of the great redemption that you have won for us in Jesus Christ, and because of the power of the Spirit at work in us, we can begin to live according to these laws. We know that we don't do this perfectly. Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. But we thank you that by the Spirit's power, we do begin to walk according to this law in the hopes that in the life to come, we will be fully sanctified and will only do what is pleasing in your sight. But we thank you that we have a Redeemer, a Mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ, who draws near to you on our behalf when we are tempted to try to flee from your presence, who brings us near to you, who sanctifies us by his blood, and spirit who washes us clean and who works this faith in us so that we might begin to walk according to your law and not sin. So we help, help us, we pray, by your spirit to live more and more according to your law, to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Forgive us for our sins because of Christ's name and fill us with that desire to live in the freedom which you've given to us in Christ. And hear our prayers for we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.